Philosophical Fragments is a Christian philosophical work written by Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard, known as the father of existentialism in 1844. It is the second of three works written under the pseudonym Johannes Climacus, the other two being Everything Must Be Doubted and Concluding Unscientific Postscript to Philosophical Fragments. Kierkegaard's various pseudonyms present different sorts of mirrors in which different sorts of readers may recognize themselves. Climacus is to serve as a mirror for the philosopher who imagines that he is making progress on the problem of how one becomes a Christian. Climacus seeks to awaken his reader to the fact that she may suffer from this tendency to forget herself, ethically and religiously speaking, and to convert these practical questions of life into merely theoretical questions of the intellect, and he does so by himself enacting the very same tendency. He is not making genuine progress as he engages in what looks to be philosophical reflection. Instead, he proceeds as if he were genuinely interested in presenting an account of how one becomes a Christian, while what he actually means to do is to try to bring out the underlying ludicrousness of such a project. The work pretends to endorse a point of view which it ultimately aims to reveal as confused, and the aim of the work therefore is to present something that has the form of an intellectual difficulty, inviting the philosopher to grapple with it and leading him to the point where the terms in which he was tempted to pose the difficulty come apart on him. If all goes according to plan, Climacus's reader will catch herself identifying with Climacus's own putatively philosophical behavior, only to have it eventually dawn on her that this entire enterprise is fundamentally confused and rests on the very same tendency that she herself suffers from, namely, a compulsion to always reflect upon the task of living a certain sort of life rather than to attend to the task itself. That is why Johannes Climacus is a very interesting character created by Kierkegaard. This work, Philosophical Fragments, is about knowledge acquisition or how one can arrive at truth. Under the subtitle of the work, there is a sub-subtitle, which says, Can a historical point of departure be given for an eternal consciousness? How can such a point of departure be of more than historical interest? And can an eternal happiness be built on historical knowledge? Kierkegaard's, Kierkegaard begins the book with a difficulty that Plato raises in the Meno. The text is as follows. Meno says, And how will you inquire, Socrates, into that which you do not know? What will you put forth as the subject of inquiry? And if you find what you want, how will you ever know that this is a thing which you did not know? And to which Socrates replies, I know, Meno, what you mean, but just see what a tiresome dispute you are introducing. You argue that man cannot inquire either about that which he knows or about that which he does not know. For if he knows, he has no need to inquire, and if not, he cannot. For he does not know the very subject about which he is to inquire. To this paradox, also known as Mino's paradox, Kierkegaard notes two possible solutions. One is the project A of Socrates, and the second is the project B. The solution Socrates gave, which is the project A, was the theory of anamnesis or a collection by which all learning and inquiry is interpreted as a kind of remembering. One who is ignorant needs only a reminder to help him come to himself in the consciousness of what he knows. Since the soul is immortal and has experienced everything an infinite number of times, man has the truth in him and it is then the task to rediscover this knowledge through dialectical interaction between two people. In this way, there is no crucial problem for us in acquiring the truth, for it is found in ourselves. We thus have the ability or condition to find the truth in ourselves and are thus not dependent on other bodies that must teach us the truth or the virtue, for example, a teacher. So there is no fundamental problem in the acquisition of the truth, which I had from the beginning without knowing it, at least according to Project A or the Socratic Project. The teacher in this Project A is the midwife. She does not impart anything to him, but merely helps him give birth, that is, recollect the truth that he already knew. He already has the conditions for getting the truth within him, and the teacher merely brings him to employ this condition and does not give him this condition. As Kierkegaard puts this, The underlying principle of all questioning is that the one who is asked must have the truth in himself and be able to acquire it by himself. The temporal point of departure is nothing, 
For as soon as I discovered that I have known the truth from eternity without being aware of it, the same instant this moment of occasion is hidden in the eternal, and so incorporated with it that I cannot even find it, so to speak, even if I sought it. Because my eternal consciousness, in my eternal consciousness, there is neither here nor there, but only everywhere and nowhere. Project A has a consequence at the moment in time, which was the starting point for the study. Socratically speaking, every starting point of time, Io Ipso, is a random, a disappearing, an occasion. The moment thereby has no meaning, because as soon as I discover that I have always known it, it becomes hidden in eternity. From the point of view of eternity, the moment is not crucial, so nothing new has happened. I just remembered what has always been in me. The Socratic is constantly moving in the imminent world. No attempt is made to give an explanation of life by something coming from outside, for example, God. And man is considered to be the most important thing in the acquisition of knowledge. Therein lies a fundamentally optimistic view of cognition. There is no truth that cannot be understood according to the thought project A. The entire book, Philosophical Fragments, starts on the front page with the question of whether a historical starting point can be given to an eternal consciousness. Based on Kierkegaard's presentation of Thought Project A, Climacus's conclusion is that Socratically thought, then the answer is no. The starting point of time is not important, but rather just random, vanishing, just an occasion, for the immortal soul already knows the truth. Since the teacher is not important either, the time at which the teacher helped the learner to cognition is equally unimportant. The learner is himself divine and has only for a short period forgotten the truth. Everything points to the conclusion that time is not important. Thus, people cannot, socially speaking, build eternal bliss on a historical knowledge. Kierkegaard ends Thought Project A with these words. The Socratic difficulty about seeking the truth seems equally impossible whether we have it or do not have it. The Socratic thought really abolishes this disjunction since it appears that at bottom every human being is in possession of the truth. This was Socrates' explanation. We have seen what follows from it with respect to the moment. Now if the latter is to have decisive significance, the seeker must be destitute of the truth up to the very moment of his learning it. He cannot even have possessed it in the form of ignorance for in that case, the moment becomes merely occasional. What is more, he cannot even be described as a seeker. For such is the expression we must give to the difficulty if we do not wish to explain it Socratically. He must therefore be characterized as beyond the pale of the truth, not approaching it like a proselyte, but departing from it or as being in error. He is then in a state of error. But how is he now to be reminded or what will profit him to be reminded of what he has not known and consequently cannot recall. In the Socratic paradigm or Project A, the seeker already has the conditions for getting the truth within him. However, in the Christian paradigm or Project B, the seeker cannot have the conditions for getting the truth within him and must receive them. Kierkegaard says, If the teacher serves as an occasion by means of which the learner is reminded, he cannot help the learner to recall that he really knows the truth. For the learner is in a state of error. What the teacher can give him occasion to remember is that he is in error. Now if the learner is to acquire the truth, the teacher must bring it to him. And not only so, but he must also give him the condition necessary for understanding it. But one who gives the learner not only the truth, but also the condition for understanding is, is more than teacher. All instruction depends upon the presence in the last analysis of the requisite condition. If this is lacking, no teacher can do anything. For otherwise, he would find it necessary not only to transform the learner, but to recreate him before beginning to teach him. But this is something that no human being can do. If it is to be done, it must be done by the God himself. So in the thought project B, the teacher is God, and both the teacher and the moment have decisive significance. As for the learner, before the intervention of God, he is incapable of the truth. The God does not give him this incapacity. He himself must be responsible for it. He must inherently be at war with the truth. Kierkegaard calls the state of being an untruth and at war with the truth the state of sin. This state of sin is also a state of unfreedom. If the learner were free, he could freely choose to be in the truth. 
But if he could do this in an effective way, he would already have the condition, but he does not. The teacher in setting him free is thus a deliverer and savior. As for the learner, when he was not in the truth, he was departing from it. Receiving the condition for the truth, he was turned around. Let us call this change conversion. His taking leave of his former state, Kierkegaard calls repentance, and his receiving the condition is called rebirth. The terminologies Kierkegaard employs here are Christian in nature. He then calls the teacher a judge in the following words. Such a teacher the learner will never be able to forget. For the moment he forgets him, he sinks back again into himself, just as one who, who while in original possession of the condition, forgot that God exists and thereby sank into bondage. If they should happen to meet in an, another life, the teacher would again be able to give the condition to anyone who had not yet received it. But to one who had once received the condition, he would stand in a different relation. The condition was a trust for which the recipient would always be required to render an account. But what shall we call such a teacher? A teacher may determine whether the pupil makes progress or not, but he cannot judge him, for he ought to have Socratic insight enough to perceive that he cannot give him what is essential. The teacher is thus not so much teacher as judge, even though even when the learner has most completely appropriated the condition and most profoundly apprehended the truth, he cannot forget his teacher or let him vanish Socratically, although this is far more profound than illusory sentimentality or untimely pettiness of spirit. It is indeed the highest, unless that other be the truth. Now, what about the moment? In this Socratic paradigm, it is in inessential. When Socrates reminds the learner of some truth that is causing him to employ his capacity for the truth, has nothing to do with the truth he learns or his capacity. For the Christian paradigm, however, it is essential. It is the moment of his receiving the condition, the moment of rebirth, about which Kierkegaard says, when the disciple is in a state of error and otherwise will be returned to Socrates, but is nonetheless a human being, and now receives the condition and the truth, he does not become a human being for the first time since he was a man already, but he becomes another man, not in the frivolent sense of becoming another individual of the same quality as before, but in the sense of becoming a man of a different quality, or as we may call him, a new creature. Kierkegaard states that the basic Christian notions of sin, repentance, conversion, rebirth, etc. do not fit into the Socratic paradigm. This is the paradigm of Greek thought. The claim then is that Christianity is outside otherwise than Greek thought. In other words, the claim of Christianity and Judaism as well to some extent is that of a transcendent God. The epistemology of Socrates and Greek philosophy is that of world as a self-sufficient whole. The latter by definition cannot encompass the claim of Christianity.